Well, welcome to the beautiful pools of Bethesda. Lots of history here going, I think, all the way from the Greeks to Napoleon Bonaparte. All sorts of people have been here and claim this property. You'll see there's a church behind me with a French flag over it. Beautiful church full of, uh, you know, people love to sing when they go there. It has echoing noise. But the thing that's most known about this place is the chapter from John chapter 5 where there's a man who's invalid and has been trying to get well for 38 years, trying to get in the water when it's stirred and can't seem to find the opportunity to get in. And that's when the famous rabbi, Jesus, enters the picture and heals him. This is a great place to end this journey because even though we often talk about the crucifixion and the resurrection and those things happen in different places, the purpose of those things is to heal us. Not just to heal us from sickness, but to heal us from our sin, to heal us from our brokenness. And so John chapter 5 really is a great model of the gospel, that we look to all these other things in life to heal us, but it's only Christ that can heal us. You know, it's when we come before God and we just receive his gift by faith that we're transformed. And that's a good reminder that even though you're not here with us in Jerusalem, and even though this is an amazing special place, and even though God's presence is here, God's presence is with you right where you are in the same way that it is here. And the thing that makes it real is, is, is faith and trusting that God's word is true. And that's, that's why so many people have such a great experience when they come to Jerusalem is they're able to dig deep and find the faith. But you can find that wherever you are. If you're in LA, if you're in New York, if you're in Berlin, if you're wherever you are, if you're in Amsterdam, if you're in Sydney, you can reach down deep and experience the Holy Spirit in the same way. God wants to be with you. So people came here because they wanted something. They wanted to be well, you know, they were, most of them were sick. And you look at how huge this place is. It's massive. I wish you could see it. It's the size of like, it feels like two football fields or something. It's, it's a massive space. And you see, you think people came here, there was probably people all over and they were just hoping for that one moment that the water would swirl and they could jump in and get well. So people came here because they wanted something. Most of the people that came to Jesus didn't want to get something like a message from Jesus or like learn some wisdom from him. Most of them wanted something. They were hungry, they were sick, they were poor, they needed help. And so they came to the great rabbi because they needed a miracle. Maybe today you need a miracle in your life. Maybe your life you just feel like you're sick and you're never going to get well. Maybe you feel like you're lost. Well, the good news is you can be found. Maybe you're broken hearted. The good news is God can heal your heart. Maybe you feel betrayed. The good news is God can help you trust again. Maybe you feel ashamed. God can heal you and cleanse you and give you a new beginning. Maybe you're broke. He can give you your daily bread and all you need to sustain your life. Maybe you're angry. You can be at peace again. And this is the good news of the gospel. In Hebrew, there's this word shalom, which we say all the time. You know, when you hear it in Israel, you go around and say shalom. It's a greeting. But it's a, we always think of the word shalom means peace, but it, there's a, a deeper meaning to it of tranquility, of wholeness, of a good life. And this is what God offers us. He offers us the good life, the best way to live. And that's what we find in Christ. So maybe you want these things. You want to be well. You want to be whole. You want to have friends. You want your life to grow. You want to live the fullness of what you were born to be. But there is a price. The price that you have to pay is to turn your back on the thing that made you sick. Many of us, we want these things, we want a better life, but we're not willing to turn our back on the people, the substances, the places, the jobs that are keeping us stuck in a rut. And so maybe a message for you today is, turn your back on the thing that's wrecking you. Turn your back on the thing that's making you sick or on the things um, that have you stuck in a rut. So that brings us to John chapter five. And this is an amazing story. I'll just read it again, even though Hannah did a great job. It starts with this, John chapter 5, verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. We couldn't find those, by the way, when, when we were looking, but, uh, but they, we know this is the spot. And it says, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been invalid for 38 years. Think about that, 38 years he was sitting here. And Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time. He asked him, 
Do you want to get well? These are words that haunt me because, you know, the man obviously wanted to get well. You'd think he was at the pools of Bethesda to get well, but Jesus asks him the question anyway. He, he says, do you want to get well? And as you think about that, Jesus probably knew something about this guy. Maybe he did want to get well and maybe he didn't. So you say, well, why, why wouldn't the guy want to get well? One reason might be that because, you know, he's got friends at this place. This is full of people. You don't sit in one place for 38 years with a bunch of people around and not, you know, make a few buddies. Maybe he thinks, if I'm well, I'm not going to be able to hang out the pool of Bethesda anymore with Joe and Jack and Bob and Ryan and all my friends. It's amazing how often people that we love, people that we care about, can keep us unwell, can keep us stuck in a rut. Second reason the man at the pool of Bethesda might not have wanted to get well is, to be honest, this was a nice place. I mean, look at it. Look at these. You, I mean, it doesn't look super nice now. It's, you know, been a little run down. But back then, wow, it would have been beautiful. The marble and the water and, you know, colonnades and coverings. And this was nice stuff. And if, he, if he'd been here for 38 years, he probably didn't have a home. Probably didn't have a place to go. But here, if you're by the pool, you know, it's a, it's a safe place. And very often, we don't get where we want to go in life. We don't make progress in life. Ironically, because we're too safe. Maybe you know a 30-something-year-old guy who wants to you know, have a great job, wants to have a family, wants to get married, but he's living in his parents' basement. You know? Or maybe you know somebody who they want to start a business. They know they can launch and get out there and, and pursue their dreams, but they're at a really safe job. And so they love the safety of the job, but they hate the job itself because maybe it pays too good or... They don't want to give up a salary. And so somehow, sometimes the nice place, the safety of it all, keeps us from becoming who we're really called to be. And I think this is what happens to a man. When you think if a guy sits in one place for 38 years, maybe the first few months he was trying, but after a while, you kind of wonder if he's just given up. And that brings us to verse 7. Jesus asks him, do you want to get well? And in verse 7 he says, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. And when the water is stirred and while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes ahead of me. Notice how he doesn't just say, yes, I want to get well. You know, think if Jesus, as famous rabbi, says, you want to get well, he'd be like, yes, heal me. He doesn't say that. He's, he gives a bunch of excuses and reasons why he couldn't get in the water. And it's, it's funny, when you see that, it's, again, every in life, every decision is a thousand renunciations. Every decision you make for God, for your family, for your life, for personal growth, for who you want to be, every time you make one of those decisions, you're rejecting other things in your life. Every one yes in your life is a thousand no's. And that's why it's hard sometimes to turn your back on the thing that's making you sick. I had a really good friend who was a great snowboarder, got in a terrible snowboarding accident, broke his back, had a couple of surgeries to try and fix it. It got worse. And he was on these pain pills to get better over time. And he just was stuck on pain pills forever. And finally, one day, there was a procedure that came out that healed his back. And he was fine. He was walking normal. He had no more back pain, but he couldn't give up the pills. It was four years he went taking those pills, and he knew they were wrecking his life. And he turned to Christ, and he cried out to God. He said, Lord, I don't need these pills anymore, but I want them. Every day, I feel like I need them. And God gave him freedom. But it's amazing how sometimes there's an excuse, like a sickness or a thing in your life that you use because the, the deeper thing is you really wanted the pills. Do you want to get well? You have to turn your back on the thing that's making you sick. Do you want to get better? You have to turn your back on the thing that's making you average. Do you want to grow? You have to turn your back on the thing that's making you comfortable. If you want to get an awesome church, you have to get up in the morning and go to church. If you want your family to get better, you probably have to turn your back on some of the rounds of golf or some of the times with your friends or the time you're spending at, at work. If you want to turn your back on addiction, if you want to get rid of addiction in your life, you're going to have to reach out for help. And this is the hard thing about life is that we just don't feel like it. We want it. We want to get better. But when push comes to shove, we just don't feel like it. Not you, my friend. Not anymore. Not anymore. It's time to make a change in your life. It's time for you to get a heart for the kind of person you can become. And not just for you, but for the people that need you.
there are people in your life that need you, that love you. And one of the best reasons we can become the best version of ourselves, to get better, to get well, to beat the things that are dragging us down, to conquer our addictions, to, to grow as, as disciples of Jesus, is because that's what people need from us. And that's what the Lord needs from us. He needs committed disciples. And of course, so the man makes a bunch of excuses, but finally Jesus just gives him a choice. He gives him a moment. And in verse 8 he says, Then Jesus said to him, Get up. Pick up your mat and walk. Now he has a, he has a moment there, right? The man can't walk. So he has a, a decision there to try in faith to believe the word of God and just stand up or to say, No, I don't feel like it because I don't want to lose my friends. I don't want to lose my pool. I don't want to lose my handouts. And by the way, if it doesn't work, that's kind of embarrassing. He doesn't think about any of those things. And congratulations to this guy. He just gets up and he walks. And he picks up his mat and does it on the Sabbath, which is also a big deal. Because Jesus could have just said, get up and walk, but he doesn't. He says, get up and pick up your mat and walk. There was probably some bad religion, bad religiosity that was also keeping the man stuck. At the end of the day, it's not religiosity that heals us. It's not special pools that heal, heal us. It's not special places. It's not anything like that. It's God. And God is available right now through Jesus Christ to heal you through his Holy Spirit, to turn your life around. And it is just an amazing thing. This is what Jesus likes to do. He likes to call ordinary people to do extraordinary things. He doesn't ask us to go to seminary and to get everything right and to learn everything. He just asked us to trust him and start acting out our faith. My friend, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. Stop waiting for all the right conditions to happen in your life. So often we are waiting for summer and not winter. We're we're waiting for all the winds to blow in the right way. We're waiting for all the conditions to be perfect. We're waiting for all the right people to come along. But the truth is, that's what the man was waiting for. He was waiting his whole life for the water to swirl and for him to be the closest and to get in. It's never going to happen if you're waiting for conditions to be right and perfect. It's just not going to happen. You have to decide that even if it's snowing, that even if it's cold outside, that even if the economy's bad, That even if everything is going against you, you're just going to make a decision today to make a difference in your life. So often we think, my life will get better when my spouse gets better. My life will get better when my employer gets better. My life will get better when the economy is better. My life will get better when the party that I like is in power. My life will get better when interest rates are better. My life will get better when taxes are better. My friend, can I tell you, things only get better when you get better. You don't have to, you don't need any of those things to change for you to become better. You can become smarter, wiser. You can go deeper in your walk with God. You can beat the things in your life if you're hand in hand with Christ. Things get better when you get better. Not when the water starts swirling and you get in. Things get better when you look to Christ and he transforms your life. It's interesting. I had a friend of mine that told me, this is a great reflection. He says, you know, human beings are the only beings on earth that can be less than they were created to be. When you think about a tree, for example, how tall does a tree get? How tall does a tree get? As big as it can get, right? No tree gets, you know, a little less. It just goes as high, as deep, and as wide as it can go, as much as it can, right? And it's interesting to think that human beings can decide to be 50% of what we were created to be. Human beings can be 10% of what we were created to be. But don't do that, my friend. Be all that you were made to be. Don't be less than you're made to be. All that you were made to be. I want to encourage you today to recognize that you choose how you spend your time. You choose how you spend your money. You choose your friends. You choose what you eat. You choose your church. If you don't like your church, change your church. You choose the media you consume. You choose the the attitudes that we have. You can choose what kind of attitude you're going to have today. You choose the books that you read. You can choose to improve the skills in your job. You can choose to improve your skills as a husband or a wife or a grandpa or grandma or a friend. Those are all skills that you can develop. And you can choose to become all that you are made to be by committing your life completely to Christ and saying, I am done, done leaning on the things that keep me in a rut. 
you can turn your back on the things that are keeping you from all that you are made to be. And most of all, you can choose life. The Bible says that the Lord lays before us life and death, blessing and curse. And he says, choose life. There's so many times in life where we look at our life and we say, you know, I'm a Christian or I'm a good person or I was, you know, baptized as a kid or something. But at the end of the day, you have to choose God. You have to choose a relationship with Him. And I would encourage you at the end of this message to just right now, wherever you are, to make a decision today to lean and trust your life to Jesus Christ. If you do that, you'll never be the same. Well, thank you, my friend. You know, you, God wants to heal you. He wants to transform your life. He wants to do good things, but you have to make a decision. The Bible says, I'll draw near to you if you draw near to me. That's what God says. And you say, well, I, don't, I just want him to just draw near to me. Nope, it doesn't work that way. You might say, well, that's not fair. Well, my friend, you got to draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Do it and watch how much he'll transform your life. I want to pray for you. Lord, I pray for the person that's watching this, wherever they are, whenever they are. I pray that today they would make a decision to get out of the boat to have a whole new life, to turn their back on the thing that's making them sick. And I pray that today they wouldn't rely on their own strength, but on the strength that you give us through your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, that you love us even when we mess up. Thank you that we're not what we do or what we have or what others say about us, but that you love us just as, just as we are. And we thank you for that. And we thank you, Lord, that you can transform our lives into anything that you want us to be. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Hi, friends. Welcome to the YouTube channel for Hour of Power in the Netherlands. Here you'll find new videos each week, and it's our prayer that they'll encourage you in the Word of God and make you feel at home in our global church family. To see all our content, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. We want to know how this message encouraged you, so please leave comments for us below. Bobby and I are sending love to all of our friends in the Netherlands, and we're praying for you. Until next time, God loves you and so do we. Hold God and ik ook.